Good morning, everybody. We're, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is David Kearney. I'm the president of the World Trade Center, and it's a privilege to be here with all of you today. We can't thank you enough for coming and joining us for this great event. And uh, with, with your support, um, it's how we make ends meet and how we continue to, to put forth efforts like this. So thank you. On behalf of our 1,000 corporate and individual members, I would like to thank you all for coming today for our executive speaker series. This is the second speaker series. We have four uh, that we're embarking on this year. And I'd like to thank First NBC Bank and Jones Walker for your generous support in sponsoring this event. And for those of you that are here from those companies, thank you again from the World Trade Center. It's my pleasure today to introduce Manny J. Perez de la Mesa. And I'm going to call him Manny just to keep it simple. Manny serves as president and CEO of Pool Corporation, which is the world's largest wholesale distributor of swimming pool supplies and equipment related to leisure products. And I'm sure with the heat index here of over 108 degrees the last week, we all are very appreciative of your products and services. He's headquartered in our backyard in Covington, Louisiana, and they employ over 3,400 employees in 300 locations worldwide dedicated to locating products at the lowest cost possible and maximizing supply chain logistics to deliver the best value to roughly 80,000 customers worldwide. And as they like to say over at Pool Corp, 70% of the earth is covered with water and we don't think that's nearly enough. <laughs> Manny has built up an impressive list of achievements over the course of his professional career and continues to be a leader in the community here locally and in the industry worldwide. He's been the director and president of Pool Corp since February of 1999. That's a, a nice term as a CEO, and uh, was CEO in May of 2001. Prior to that, uh, Manny served as VP of Distribution Operations at Watso Incorporated, and has also uh, worked for Del Monte and IBM. Most recently, Manny served as the director for American Repro Graphics Company from 2002 to 2004 when he became its independent director and he went on as an independent director for Morrison Supply Company. He has an MBA from St. John's University and a BBA from Florida International University and we love having folks educated in Florida uh, here in Louisiana um, teaching us how to, how to do business. And uh, we, we are grateful that you're here, Manny, and we look forward to your remarks. And uh, we will have a Q&A afterwards, so please come up with some good questions for Manny uh, when he finishes his remarks. And then after, uh, Manny will stick around for anyone that wants to uh, ask him questions directly. So again, welcome, Manny, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good to see a few friendly faces here. Um, what I have here is what we uh, refer to as our investor presentation. And um, it's interesting, when I give this presentation, uh, usually along in the first five minutes, people ask me, where is Covington, Louisiana? <laughs> so I have to provide a little history lesson uh, for, for those uh, investors uh, or prospective investors as well. So with that, I'm going to start and just give you a little perspective. In doing this, I will also tell you that um, uh, what we try to do is, is educate investors as to our business, but it also serves, I think, to provide a perspective on, on business overall. Uh, there's a number of concepts that I'll throw out in the course of, of, of this presentation that I think cross all business. And, uh, and in fact, in some cases, cross uh, a, a broader spe uh, spectrum. But with that, one thing that uh, we have to be very sensitive of in today's day and age is attorneys. And, um, and I have a, a few attorney friends. In fact, I have uh, four immediate family members that are attorneys. And um, 
we have to say this uh, so as that uh, <laughs> the standard disclaimer. Uh, overview, we are uh, by far uh, the leader and the largest, two different concepts, but the leader and the largest in what is a niche industry uh, worldwide basis. We have a strong track record of performance. Uh, the company uh, in its current state came into being at the end of 1993 when a private equity firm out of Chicago acquired a regional distributor that was at that time operating out of Metairie, Louisiana. Uh, that regional distributor had about $60 million in sales and operated, I believe, out, out of 16 locations in the south central part of the country. And that private equity firm bought the business at, at the end of 93 with the idea of expanding the network through a process of opening new locations as well as acquisitions. And they were thinking nationally. That private equity firm essentially exited uh, the business altogether at the end of 98 and I came in right after they exited. Um, going forward, uh, some of you may be aware of the fact that we were, went through a recession. Uh, that recession was especially hard on the new construction sector, especially hard as well on discretionary spend. Uh, so that certainly affected our industry. Uh, we've weathered that uh, reasonably well, as you'll see in a few charts. But as we come out of that, recession and, and, and uh, the hit on discretionary spend, the expectations are that over the next seven to 10 years, there'll be a gradual recovery. So uh, instead of the, of the real strong headwind that we had uh, for about three, four years, we'll have a little bit of a, of a tailwind over the next uh, seven to 10 years. 2012 marked our um, third year, uh, consecutive year, where we had earnings per share growth uh, in excess of 20%. And, and in fact, uh, in 2012, we realized record sales and earnings. And, and the remarkable thing in my mind about that statement, uh, because that would be in my, my thinking a normal expectation, is that that was realized in an environment where new pool construction in the US still down 70% from the levels of 2006. And where replacement and remodeling activity is down 25 to 30% below normal behavior. So you look at that, that to have those kind of results in an environment um, uh, that's still very depressed is, is I think, pretty good. Um, and then, uh, given our infrastructure, this is not unlike most businesses, uh, distribution that doesn't uh, have the same leverage characteristics as manufacturing, but still has leverage characteristics. So as as the business comes forward and we come out of this uh, depressed uh, perspective or period, there's a fair amount of leverage uh, going up and, and therefore that translates to improved profitability or, or profitability is growing at a faster rate than sales and uh, better return on invested capital. Now, let me see here. Uh, our business. Uh, last year, our sales was just a shade under $2 billion. This year, there'll be a shade over $2 billion. Uh, the lion's share of that uh, overall, 90% is in the United States. 10% is in nine other countries. Uh, seven in Europe plus Canada and Mexico. Uh, when you cut our business, the other way to cut it is, and this is more how we organize managerially, is 86% of our business is North American swimming pool distribution. Uh, we have two networks. We sell to the professional trade, just a little further background. So we sell to contractors and we sell to uh, independently owned retail stores. So if you have an individual that builds pools, uh, remodels pools, replaces equipment on a pool, repairs the, uh, any aspect of a pool or maintains a pool, those are all prospective customers of ours. As well as the uh, independently owned retail store that sells any of the products, pool chemicals, pool supplies, to that consumer. Um, we have the same type of business in Europe, again in seven countries, that's 5% of our, our sales, with France being our largest operation in Europe. And then in 2005, we looked at characteristics of other trade distribution businesses and, and we had begun studying irrigation landscape businesses in 1999 and, had, and saw similar characteristics in the irrigation landscape uh, sector as we did in the swimming pool sector. 
So we invested in a platform acquisition in 2005, have continued to build on that, and, and also uh, that represents, that's, that's our third network, and that participates, uh, or that represents 9% of our total business. So that's kind of a context of who we are. Um, uh, a little further information is our networks. Uh, we have two networks on the pool side of the equation. The SCP network, by the way, that stands for Safe Clean Pools. Um, not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we have the Superior network. Uh, those two networks are uh, our way to serve the professional trade um, in the US and Canada. Uh, SCP is the only moniker we use in Mexico and in Europe. And then the Horizon Network is for the irrigation landscape side. So uh, again, three networks. You can see also the density of our locations are heavily weighted to where the pools are. And I'm gonna go back to that or go, you know, refer to that several times during the presentation. Uh, from, a, from a fundamental standpoint as a distributor, we're aggregating products uh, from uh, over 2,000 vendors worldwide and we bring those products and make them locally available to the professional trade. That's part of our value proposition to the, to the marketplace. So in, in doing that, uh, we have to have those customers uh, locally available and readily available uh, together with a whole slur, uh, uh, suite of services that we provide to those same customers. But the essence of it is you can see the higher density of locations in markets like California, Florida, Texas, and Arizona, those four states represent just over half of our total sales. So that gives you another flavor there of our business. By the way, we operate in 35 states in the United States, and uh, I mentioned nine other countries. As a distributor, uh, we provide value. And, 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 and this is, you step back in business, and you gotta say, why are you here? You know, what do you do in business? Uh, what do you do in any organization that provides value? And uh, the first fundamental I touched on earlier in terms of a distributor provides value by aggregating products from a myriad of suppliers and bringing them and making them locally available. Uh, you can also provide other services as well, and there's some, some of those are listed here. Uh, for example, we provide technical support. We provide extensive training of our customers. We provide extensive marketing. So for example, if you, have, if you have direct mail from a local pool retail store that's trying to entice you to go to that retail store to get some of your need to maintain your pool, in all likelihood, that came from us. Uh, we have over 2,000 websites that we created and built on behalf of customers. So when you type any kind of pool type affiliation, uh, keywords, and doing a search, uh, in all likelihood, one of our URLs, we have over 300 URLs, one of our URLs surfaces on page one. In fact, if not several URLs surface on page one. And if they're not one of our URLs, the other possibility is they're one of our customer's URLs whose websites we maintain and drive traffic to. So those are services that we provide to our customers to help them grow and succeed in their businesses. Because one of the things that we understand in our business as a distributor is that if our customers don't succeed, we don't succeed. Uh, and therefore, whatever we can do to help our customers succeed, in turn helps us succeed. And marketing is one of those services as well as technical support, management support, and a lot of other things that are listed here. One of the other interesting things here that I, that I highlight for investors is the fact that in this, in this distribution space, you have significant fragmentation at both ends of the, of the supply chain. When you look at the barriers to entry to be a customer in our business, the barriers are, are pretty low. If you're doing pool maintenance, you need a basic business license and a pickup truck. So that's pretty low barriers to entry. Um, depending on the state that you're in, you have further licensing requirements. Like for example, in Florida and California, depending on what you do on the pool, you, you may need another one or two more licenses. But having said that, there's still fairly low barriers to entry. On the other end of the spectrum, the barriers to entry are not that significant 
uh, in terms of, of, of science, but what happens is that in many cases, the products that are sold in our industry are either complementary products or niche products. So for example, um, our number one chemical supplier is Occidental. So Occidental is obviously known for a lot of other products other than cool chemicals. But a byproduct of their manufacturing certain other products is, is, is basically a feed into making three inch taps, which is a basic uh, sanitizer for cool products. So what you have is a plethora of suppliers at the other end of the spectrum. And what that does, it enhances the value that a distributor in the middle can provide in the marketplace. When you look at other supply chain and distributor models, you see that in many cases, either one end of the spectrum or the other dominates. And in this particular case, the fragmentation of both ends enables distribution to provide uh, significant value. These are our financial results um, over the 10 year uh, time frame. The way we look at our business and make decisions is usually a 10 to 20 year time horizon. Uh, now there are certain decisions that we make with a shorter time horizon of five to seven years. But most things we do, most investments that we make, we have a longer term time horizon. For example, when we were looking at the irrigation landscape space, we're looking at uh, penetration of irrigation systems in US single family households. And we look at the penetration being <coughs> somewhere in the low double digit percentage. And we know that uh, most consumers that have single family homes want to have landscaping. And we know that water will progressively be more of a scarce resource. We also know that single family home, uh, household formation will be much greater in the Sun Belt, where consumers are more inclined to invest in outdoor lifestyle space. So because of those characteristics, and we look at the, at the long term demographics, we believe that the growth of irrigation landscape will be at a rate three to four times GDP growth over the next 10 to 20 year time horizon because of just those underlying factors that I just described. And that gives us then the, the, the motivation to make the investment thinking along the lines of that we built up a network, we improve our business processes, we progressively enhance the value proposition that we provide to our customers and suppliers, we can then realize the growth rate and return on capital that our shareholders are looking for. Turning back, you can see the impact, uh, and, and we're gonna touch on it later, but you can see the impact on, on, on sales, gross profits, and uh, EBITDA from the headwinds that we had in the marketplace. When new pool construction came down 80% from 2005 to the trough of 2009. When uh, replacement and remodeling activity, which is a discretionary spend, came down by over 30% from normal behavior. The fortunate part of that process is that uh, we continue to be profitable, cash flows uh, were strong, and uh, everything was good. Obviously, uh, as part of our management thought process, not only are we focused on the longer term in terms of our investment decisions, but we also are very fundamentally oriented in terms of how we manage our business. We believe that independent of what accounts may capture as profits, Real profits are cash, and cash generated in the business. So to that end, uh, our cumulative cash flow from operations, in fact, over time, has exceeded net income as we've made gradual improvements right, in working capital management. We also are very focused on return on equity. Shareholders entrust us with the capital, and we're looking to provide a return on that capital that's entrusted to us. Uh, and we're back over 30% in, in, in that regard. And then, uh, uh, earnings per share, compounded 11% growth uh, per year over a 10 year time horizon. Now, just for a little perspective, through 2006, uh, from the company's uh, inception of going public in 1995, to, through 2006 over that 11 year time horizon, our compounded earnings per share growth, growth was in fact over 30% per year. <coughs> and that put us in the top 1% of Fortune 1000 companies. Now obviously, we're not there anymore, but uh, we're looking to get back quickly. 
given the nature of our business, we generate a, a fair amount of cash. And then to the extent that we don't find the right investment opportunities for the company that provides the right long-term growth characteristics and return on capital characteristics that we're looking for, we return that excess capital or excess cash generated back to shareholders. We do that in two forms. We do that in the form of dividends and we do that in the form of share repurchases. In 2011, 2012, we repurchased uh, over $150 million of the stock and we continue to increase our earnings per share at a 15% compounded growth annually. Currently, we're paying 76 cents per share in terms of um, dividends per year. The pool market, this is now focused on the domestic market representing 82% of our total sales. Fortunately, these almost 10 million pools have to be maintained. Um, so for those of you that own a pool, um, I appreciate the business. The, uh, we sell to two customers that are completely focused on basic pool maintenance and repair. We do that through independent retailers, representing about 30% of our sales, and we do that through uh, customers that do basic pool maintenance as well as minor repairs. That's another 30% of our business. This 60% of our business we look as uh, non-discretionary. 27% of our business is refurbishment and remodeling activity. If you look at the equipment that runs the pool, pump, filter, heater, cleaner, these are like uh, washer, dryer, refrigerator, air conditioning systems. These items need to be repaired and periodically replaced. The other side of that is just like you have a roof and you have walls you need to repaint, we have the pools have to be resurfaced over a period of time. You have salt, I mean, you have water going through those pools. And because of that water going through those pools uh, and all the elements they're exposed to over the course of time, you have to resurface the pool as well. That represents 27% of our business. And then the last 13% is new pool construction. As a matter of reference, new pool construction was over 30% of our sales back in 2006. In terms of product spectrum, you look at the breadth of products as an individual category. Chemicals is our number one product category. But we sell a lot of different stuff. If you think about a pool, and just think about the components of a pool, we sell the cement. We buy cement by the boatload, uh, and that's literally by the boatload, uh, primarily imported from Egypt and Turkey. Uh, we buy rebar by the boatload. Um, we then buy uh, plaster. These are our products we, we sell to our customers. Plaster, the components that make the plaster look nicer, pebbles and glass. All the equipment that runs the pool, pump, filter, heater, the cleaner, all the controls, <coughs> the uh, coping, deck products. We sell all sorts of hardscapes products. We go beyond the hardscapes. We sell outdoor kitchens. We sell hot tubs. We sell landscape lighting. We sell irrigation systems. In some states, we also sell water. Full service. <laughs> Given the course of time, we have built out our network. And although our customers are, are local, so we're selling who we compete with in, in, in Metairie, Louisiana, is different than who we compete with in Baton Rouge. And it's different again in Jackson, Mississippi. And it's different again in Memphis. And it's different in Nashville. So our competitors are local, our customers our competitors are by and large local, some are regional. Uh, our customers are all virtually all local. So therefore, uh, we are uh, by far the largest in the industry. In fact, when you look at number of, of, of locations, uh, you have to add up the next 53 uh, competitors to have the same number of locations as we have. Uh, Doesn't mean a lot on a local basis. It means a lot. <coughs> when you understand the commitment that we've made to the industry, the commitment we've made to our customers, the commitment we've made to a number of 
of suppliers, domestic and worldwide, to really grow the industry and grow our customers' businesses and the investments we've made in our customers, whether it be marketing, technology, whatever it may be, to help drive their businesses forward. Pool maintenance, very stable. I gave you some of the dynamics earlier. That, from a market standpoint, should grow at a 2 to 4% per year, 2 to 4% rate per year. Uh, that's driven by the install base of pools growing, as well as a little bit of inflation. Um, this is the uh, customer segment that has the highest gross margins. Part of that is because the dollar transactions are smaller. So when you're selling more smaller dollar items, you need a, a little higher margin percent to compensate you for the uh, services provided. This is driven entirely by the install base of pools in ground and above ground. In ground pools represent about 70% of the consumables. Above grounds represent about 30% of the consumables on an annual basis. For the better part of 40 years, this install base is growing at a, a rate of better than 3% per year, independent of inflation, independent of interest rates, independent of the economy, until 2006 to 2009. For the first time ever in the industry's history, new pool construction, new pool construction actually went down. But it's still growing. It's growing at about a 1% rate per year now. Replacement and refurbishment, I touched on it earlier. Demand here is driven by the aging of the install base of pools. And uh, this is somewhat discretionary. Uh, consumers, in some cases, opted to repair versus replace. In some cases, opted not to do anything at all. Much like some, some consumers opted not to paint their houses when they were uncertain about what was coming forward, some consumers opted not to replace their heater and their pool. Uh, there's a, our projections are for a gradual recovery of demand uh, where we have normal behavior, consumer behavior by 2018. And what we're looking at there, if you look at a leading indicator, is we're looking at consumer confidence to be back to 100 by 2016. And there's about a 12 to 24 month lag uh, to, for that to hit this sector. Here we talk about the aging of the install base of pools focused on in-ground pools. That's the, uh, area that, that requires the most uh, great amount of investment. And then new pool construction. Touched on this earlier, 80% drop from peak to trough. And we're looking at that to gradually recover uh, with expectations that, that the sector will be back to normal behavior, not peak level behavior, but normal behavior between 2020 and 2022. Um, when you look at our expectations here, uh, they tend to lag uh, what the new home, single family home sector is doing. Um, two factors, one factor is we're a little bit more conservative uh, that, than some of the pool tees and, and, and larger builders uh, would be. Uh, and the other factor is that uh, financing is, is, a, is a influence here and uh, you have to have the financing markets coming back and behavior from a financial institution standpoint reverting back to normal behavior as it was in the late 19, mid to late 1990s. Not what it was in the 03 to 06 period, but uh, mid to late 1990s. Some of the factors that play into that, obviously uh, home prices are a leading indicator in terms of anticipating how the market will stabilize and gradually recover over time. And then here you can see a, a, in this chart a visual depiction of what happened to new pool construction. I mean, you know, down 80% is pretty striking. Uh, and, and the fact that we haven't really recovered. You see the 2012 is, we're just still playing with the bottom there. Our expectations that'll gradually recover to get back to what it was in the late 1998, time timeframe by 2020. So, um, that's the expectation in that regard. Irrigation landscape, uh, closer tied to new, cons uh, new, uh, new home construction, sorry, single family home construction. Uh, our weighting there is much like on the swimming pool side, heavier weighted to the sun belt uh, by design um, with heavy emphasis uh, in this particular case in, in California, Arizona, and Texas, and a, and a small presence currently in Florida, building that presence currently. Um, 
a lot of leverage in this regard going forward. Here, the tie and the correlation is in the, in the next, in that we we'll call near to midterm, in the next five to seven years, be closer to recovery of single family home construction. But then after that, it'll continue to grow at a rate a little faster than single family home construction, uh, given the characteristics I described in demographics and water being progressively more of a scarce resource. And Europe, uh, we're focused on the largest markets in Europe. On a worldwide basis, by the way, uh, swimming pools, and, and, and by the way, the, the play here is, is, or the volume is residential pools. The U.S. represents about 60% of the world market. The next largest market is Europe, and that represents almost 30% of the world market. So between North America and Europe, we're participating in about 90% of the world market. And here we're focused on the largest markets. France is the largest, Spain is the second largest, Germany is the third largest, and then you would have Italy and then the U.K. Um, and uh, a lot of runway there over time. Obviously, we're having some headwinds. Um, the situation in Europe, obviously, particularly uh, some countries in Southern Europe are, are under significant stress. Uh, we're not in Greece, uh, fortunately. Um, but we are in Portugal. And, and we are in Spain, where you have 26% unemployment, uh, over 60% unemployment. In, um, uh, 18 to 25 demographic. So uh, that obviously is affecting discretionary spend. But uh, in perspective, uh, our sales, although down year on year in, in Europe, uh, through July, we're only down 3% year, year on year. So in that very negative environment, we're gaining a lot of share. Um, and that's ironic when you say you're down 3%. But given all the pressures in the industry or on the macro economy, that we're only down three is remarkable. Uh, we've been building our business gradually over time and uh, continue to do that. When you put it all together, uh, we're looking at a number of characteristics on a go-forward basis, looking at the 2020. Uh, we're looking at the industry, and these are industry, our expectations for the industry to essentially grow at a 4 to 7% rate per year, uh, given all the factors that we talked about earlier. And then for us, uh, if you look at the subtotal, that's the industry, we have uh, an expectation to grow faster than the industry. Part of that is our, our augmenting our, our, our product offering. Uh, and secondly, by our gaining share, by providing better service, better value uh, to our customers and our suppliers. And that's something that we, we, it's part of our culture. Uh, our culture is to invest in getting better. Uh, we have very well-defined expectations uh, for, for each one of our people. Uh, those expectations are communicated to the individuals. Uh, there's ongoing communication that are, that's uh, available daily. So if you look at key metrics, uh, if you are a salesperson in the organization, you know your targets. Your targets are defined by month, by customer, by product. That information is updated on a daily basis based on actual results. And that information is visible up both line and staff management. So, uh, and I'm just giving you one example. That applies also to operations or inventory management or every position in the company. So the, the metrics are updated daily and available readily. Um, I believe that performance appraisals are redundant uh, because you get a, a, a report card on a daily basis in terms of what you're doing and how you're doing. And also, you also know exactly how you compare vis-a-vis -vis all your peers. These are just fundamentals that are instilled throughout the organization. So that enables us to grow at a rate faster than market because of all the investments made and how we do and run our business. Uh, after experiencing the downturn, uh, we've been able to have consistent growth and um, you know, going forward, it should look very good. And by the way, this is not uh, one of my two pools, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just giving you a perspective of an alternative backyard pers uh, 
I have been known to comment about the fact that um, a swimming pool is the best form of waterfront property. Um, <laughs> safer, cleaner, and um, more enjoyable. Probably less expensive as well. So uh, with that, plenty of time for questions, I believe. So, yes, sir. Why Covington? You know, that's, uh, after I tell them that we're based in Covington, that's usually the next question, why Covington? Um, well, what happens is that the, uh, the first acquisition made by the private equity company I mentioned earlier was based at a Metairie. Uh, uh, about a year or two later, they moved the offices to Covington. And when I came on board uh, at the beginning of 99, uh, the offices were in Covington. There was a, a good base of individuals there that, that were really very focused on, on serving their customers, which is all of our distribution center uh, at the time. Uh, and and have, we, what we've done is build on that. And, and you have, uh, basically it's an administrative base. Um, we have close to 300 employees, so almost 10% of our employee population is based in, in Covington. Um, and in fact, uh, over the last six years, uh, we've consolidated, we had administrative centers in Anaheim, California, and another one in, in uh, Chandler, Arizona, and we consolidated uh, those into, um, into Covington. The only one we haven't consolidated into Covington is one we have in Massey, uh, which is just south of Paris, France, um, and the logistics don't make that work. Uh, but, uh, and all the regulatory and language requirements that are involved when you're dealing in all these different countries. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's a good stable base of, 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 of people that provide a very good service and, uh, and we've been able to grow and build on that. Um, we have, uh, as a couple of side notes, uh, our primary data center for where we house our, our, our whatever, dozens of, of servers that are used to drive all of our systems, both domestically and internationally, are based in Dallas, in, a, in one of those shelter facilities, bomb type shelter facilities that are right on a communications line, so we have no, no uh, last mile. We're on that mile. Uh, and, and therefore, our people on the IT side go back and forth a lot, but of our, a lot of our programming and systems analysts and those people are, are based in Covington. Yes, sir. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, we had to refurbish our pool, and at that time, I um, put in a salt system, and I'm very, very happy with that. And but there's no chemicals. Has that affected your business at all? Sure. Um, so you did that in 2005, 2006. Pardon? You did that in 2005 or 2006. The salt system. Put that in. Yes. Okay. Have you replaced your salt cell? since? No, it seems to still functioning. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had the guy maintain it one time. I don't know if it was a new element in it or not. Uh, uh, we did a number of market studies back in 1999-2000. And um, uh, one of the uh, biggest impediments to uh, putting in a pool was the, the perspective that it was very complicated uh, to maintain or difficult to maintain. So we looked at alternative systems and salt systems have been in this industry since the uh, 1960s. So we looked at uh, uh, salt as, a, as an alternative uh, uh, sanitizer alternative and that would take some of the hassle factor out of, out of pool maintenance. And when we looked at it over a long period of time, uh, we looked at the selling the salt system plus selling the replacement cells every three to four years um, <laughs> over, over, the, over the lifespan should replace uh, basic pool sanitizer in terms of from a revenue standpoint. So basically shifting uh, basic pool sanitizer, let's say three inch tabs or bleach to, um, to the, the the salt system itself plus the replacement cells. So it's a trade-off and a net zero, but at the same time making the pool easier to maintain. Uh, about 25% currently of in-ground pools in the United States 
have a salt system as their main uh, form of sanitation. I suspect you have a pool guy coming into your pool like once a week. You don't? You do that yourself? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully you buy some specialty chemicals every so often. Oh uh, yeah, I, you know I have a whole supply system guy that that I test the water, you know, sure. every two or three weeks, you know. Good. And I have the necessary chemicals, but I don't have to buy buckets and buckets. No, no, it it it, it takes and a it, big it, load. I'm gonna tell you, the pool sweep, the improved pool sweep and the salt system, you know, it makes owning a pool almost. It's beautiful. It's just wonderful. <laughs> you know, we may use you for one of our commercials. <laughs> no, 35 years ago, owning a pool was like having a red-headed stepchild. It was a pain. I mean, no. But no. now it's, it's much easier. Thank you. Let me get your car. We may actually use you in a commercial. Go ahead. Yes, sir. <laughs> just wanted to follow up on your comments about Europe, Manny. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, given the fact that in Northern Europe you've got weather issues, in Southern Europe, as you mentioned, you've got some economic downside issues mm -hmm. potentially there. It's only 5% of your business. Is it something that you guys are really committed to being in Europe? I believe that Johnson Outdoor has announced that in Southern Europe they're actually closing some of their operations. Is that a viable business? I heard you say it's 30% of the world market, but can you make money there given those challenges? Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Uh, and again, we have a long view. Uh, so we understand that there are cycles and everything else. And, and the weather in Northern Europe, by the way, this year was terrible. I was in, uh, I have uh, quarterly reviews in, in Europe, uh, and I was there the first week of July in France. It was 50 degrees and raining. I mean, not really conducive to being in a pool. But having said that, um, again, that's, uh, and flooding in Germany. We have a long view. There's two drags on our um, uh, profitability and return on capital in Europe as compared to the United States. Uh, one drag is that despite having a common currency, uh, you still have laws unique to each country. For example, the wording on an invoice, the wording on a purchase order is unique country to country, not just language, but Legally, the wording is, is unique. So therefore, we have a small administrative base in each country. So therefore, that's an, a, a cost drag versus the leverage that we're able to realize from an administrative support standpoint in the United States. The second drag is people. And what happens here in, in the United States is that we have a, a, a program where we recruit kids out of school, uh, 40 to 50 kids out of school every year. We put them through a seven month training program. They graduate from the program, move into professional positions. And these kids and, and, and our, our people within the company migrate to where opportunities are. They don't have to, but usually somebody raises their hand. Um, so what happens is if we have a need in Columbia, South Carolina, Somebody from Tennessee may move to South Carolina. Now they may still root for Tennessee and, and during football season, but <laughs> right? other than that maybe that week they'll survive in South Carolina. Uh, and and from, we have individuals from Georgia moving to Florida, from Florida moving to Texas, and Texas to California. Although it's more from California to Texas than from Texas to California, but that's another discussion. The point is that uh, you have migration. In Europe, that's a lot harder. You know, it's very hard to pull somebody from France and transfer them to Italy or, uh, or from Italy to Spain. So that's a limitation in terms of our ability to mobilize talent to address opportunities that we have within the organization. So therefore, um, the progression that we can make in the U.S. in terms of performance that I talked about, touched on earlier, we're not able to make that level of progression at the same rate in, in Europe as we are here. Yes, sir. What percentage of the products that you sell are made in America? For what we sell in the United States, uh, it would be between 85 and 90 percent. Uh, made in the United States for the U.S. market. Um, obviously, for Europe, the percentage is a lot smaller. Yes, sir. 
Manny, what's uh, research and development? How is that managed? Sure. Um, there's two aspects. We have uh, product management uh, as a distributor, which is unique from a functional standpoint. Um, so our product management group, depending on uh, what product sectors they're, they're, uh, they have responsibility for. So for example, in the case of chemicals, our product manager for chemicals works with chemical manufacturers here and other countries in terms of chemicals and the development of chemicals to uh, better serve the industry. So for example, in fact, earlier this week, I was in Seattle um, uh, with a manufacturer uh, that is very progressive in terms of, of using uh, certain polymers uh, for water sanitation, not just for pools, but and their primary focus is really drinking water. Um, and, and working with them in terms of uh, adapting some of that, that science uh, for pool sanitation. Uh, so, and that's really, I mean, the fact that I was there is, you know, I just get in the way. Uh, are people that really know this stuff, uh, they work very closely with them. And the same thing applies, for example, um, we work on, in terms of pool services, for example, we have a focus on, on hardscape products. So in hardscape products, uh, we have people that work with manufacturers, domestic and overseas, in terms of different formulations that provide uh, aesthetically a better, a better finish, as well as have better durability over time uh, for, for those pools. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick question, question. actually it's a question from my table right here. Um, concerning the boatload of cement and boatload of rebar, maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but I certainly hope that's coming to the port of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't get into the logistics, but... <laughs> We can talk about that later. <laughs> um, frankly, we're looking at, and I'll tell you how that works, we look at what the end markets are for those products, and I know, practically speaking, depending where they're coming from, uh, California and Texas are two very significant markets, as are Florida. So if instead of having 4.5 million population in, in, in Louisiana, if we've got 14.5, we'd have a lot more traffic coming into Port New Orleans. Yes, sir. Yes, use of cash. Uh, our first objective is internal use in terms of internal investment, whether it be opening of new locations. When I look at our network, about 40% of our network are new locations that we invested in. And the investment there is not so much the facility itself, but more so the working capital uh, inventory and then subsequently, hopefully, receivables. Uh, to, to take that business forward. So first of all is internal investments. Uh, second uh, would be acquisitions, and that's similar to internal, but in the sense that that's a, another way to enter a, a market where we don't have physical presence. We look at a market and let's say, uh, let's say it's Czechoslovakia. And if we have no presence in Czechoslovakia, we look at, do we enter that market, period, and if the answer is yes, we should be in that market, and the second question is, do we enter by acquiring somebody there, or do we enter by opening a new location? And so acquisitions would be the second use of capital. Third, by virtue of the commitment being a perceived long-term commitment, we have dividends. And then fourth, uh, in the current state, it'd be share repurchases. Uh, and then fifth would be debt repayment. And fourth and fifth fluctuate when we are, we're very conservatively structured from a capital structure standpoint. Uh, our debt to EBITDA is about 1.3, 1.4 right now. So whenever we have less than two times debt to EBITDA, that fourth alternative is share repurchase. Uh, once we go above two, not to say that that's not, that between two and three is still conservative, but once we go above two, we tend to be, uh, go to debt repayment moves to the fourth priority. And again, that's part of our capital structure in terms of aligning um, a balanced to, to conservative capital structure. Can you talk about uh, some initiatives you've taken to help uh, get finance, your customers getting financing for new pool construction? And then secondly, uh, different question, but uh, Amazon, is that a customer or a competitor? Uh, I'll touch on Amazon first. Um, 
Ironic, I was there on Tuesday. Um, Amazon is both a customer and a competitor. Um, it's interesting uh, the thought process that Amazon has and how they conduct their business. Um, I'm still waiting. I'm not sure if you guys have a short on it or a long on it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I still can't get through to the multiple. Um, Amazon uh, wants to provide the consuming marketplace, both domestic and, and worldwide, uh, an opportunity to purchase conveniently on the internet. And the presumption is that uh, they will do that at a very competitive price because they take cost out of how to do business. And, and to a large extent, they're right. And that certainly created a lot of friction with the uh, standalone retail operations. It includes also, by the way, not only standalone retail operations, but you look at a Walmart and Home Depot and everybody else like that. Um, you know, that's, that's Amazon's number one target. There are certain product categories uh, where there is limited need for that retailer to provide value or service to the customer, um, such as in buying a book, as an example, or a CD, where they can compete very, very effectively. Uh, so there's some niche categories that they can really do very well in and have a high level of penetration, and other retail product categories that require more handholding and therefore, in those product categories, um, uh, the, the, the storefront has an opportunity to still sustain its, its value proposition. And then you get to some product categories that are physically very inefficient to ship, um, such as building materials. And in that particular case, um, that's, again, the local supplier has a, has a lot of advantage there. Um, they are in the pool category. Uh, they are the largest, in three years, have become the largest internet retailer in, that, in this space. Uh, so therefore, as a result, they're a customer of ours. We sell to them uh, about 8,000 different SKUs uh, out of our 80,000 uh, that we have domestic. Uh, so uh, they're there. Just like Sears did 70 years ago, they reach a point where you can only have certain level of market penetration given its current model. And just like Sears found out when their catalog model kind of reached a, a friction point, they opened it, started opening up local stores. And that's the same thing that Amazon is doing. So uh, Amazon currently has a presence in 11 metro areas where they have uh, the availability for, for same day service. Uh, and that will grow to probably the next five years to about 60 to 80 metro markets. And, and, and at that point, they will be more of a competitor to everybody, uh, much like a Costco is a competitor today. Um, from, a, from a practical standpoint, um, we look at this, and it's a good and bad. Um, we already have a culture of constantly getting better. But to have a little pressure from a customer to impose that on us is, is, is a good thing, I think. Um, where it's going to be the ones that are going to be really hurt hard are our competitors, because our competitors have not made historically the level of investment they need to make on on service level to the customer, uh, on technology, on marketing, on differentiating their value add proposition, and, and therefore, much like Walmart's biggest in impact was not on Safeway or Stop and Shop. Walmart's biggest impact was on that local grocery store, right, that didn't have the breadth of offering, didn't have the service level, right? May have had the local relationship, but didn't have the breadth of offering or service level as the, the professionally managed supermarket chains would have had, or, have, um, or the professionally managed retail stores. I mean, you have uh, retail uh, networks that have done very well uh, over the course of time, independent of Walmart's entry into their space. Uh, it just raises the bar. And, and the ones that are going to be uh, feeling the greatest pain are uh, the distributors that are the weaker anchor link in there. The other question you had was finance. Yeah, sorry. 
And um, yes, we, we have uh, worked with a number of banks. In fact, we have a, uh, a program now, um, they're not represented in this room, uh, SunTrust, um, that uh, they provide a, a vehicle for unsecured financing uh, to homeowners. They're the, they're the first ones that have begun to get back into that space uh, on a national basis where they offer uh, the ability for a consumer to apply online for up to $50,000 uh, an unsecured loan. Um, based on their credit history, they get approval within uh, usually you know, one to two minutes. And, um, and therefore, that enables that, uh, that either pool owner to remodel their pool or non-pool owner to add a pool and based on that financing source. Um, the only caveat with that is that uh, as SunTrust has done this, uh, they're geared towards uh, uh, call it above average to above credit rating. Uh, so they're not geared to the middle market so much as they are to like 720 and above credit rating. So that's the only element here. But I, I suspect that others will begin to, to participate uh, gradually over time. And then uh, secondarily, there'll be uh, a gradual relaxation to a little bit lower, but not low. We don't want it to be low, uh, a little lower uh, credit rating standard. Yes, sir. Two questions. Uh, with the growth of the middle class in Brazil, uh, what kind of uh, plans does Pool Corp have for Latin America, especially Brazil? And two, uh, do you have anything in your 10 to 20 year plan to be a manufacturer or to acquire a manufacturer? Um, Latin America. Uh, Brazil is the largest market by far in Latin America. There are uh, just over 1 million pools in Brazil. Uh, but Brazil has historically been uh, very protective of, of domestic manufacturing. Um, and uh, because of that, our opportunity to enter the main markets of Brazil are limited and, 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 and to be uh, successful. Uh, there are opportunities in the next five to 10 years to participate in Brazil, not so much in, um, in the Sao Paulo Rio markets, but more toward northern Brazil. Um, and I'm not sure how much, how well you know Brazil, but, but in the Pernambuco area, um, that, uh, that market in, in the northeast is an, an area that's not well served, and that's an opportunity for us. Uh, from a market size standpoint, it's similar to Colombia. Uh, we currently are in Colombia uh, via 3PL. We will have a, a physical presence there at, in 14. Uh, we've been selling to customers in, in, in uh, Colombia for several years. Uh, we have a presence with three locations now in Mexico. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you consider it Latin America or not, but we have a location in Puerto Rico. Uh, it is a U.S. territory, but um, very independent in many respects. So that's uh, another situation there. So we are building our base all together. Uh, uh, Latin America, in terms of the overall market, represents about five to six percent of the world market. So we're, we're going to play there, but we're going to play there where it makes sense for us in terms of return on capital. Um, uh, the other question was manufacturing. manufacturing. Uh, we currently have limited manufacturing uh, in Canada and in Italy. Uh, we historically have also had uh, manufacturing interests or, uh, in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana uh, and in Charlotte, North Carolina uh, with uh, plants to uh, for uh, packaged food products. We don't look to be in manufacturing unless um, it came as part of something that we acquired or where there is some level of long-term proprietary basis for that, uh, for being in that space. The sentiment here is that the lion's share of the products that we distribute there is uh, plenty of manufacturing capacity and supply. So therefore, we're in a pretty good stead in terms of where we are in that equation. The fact that, uh, the, the fact that we can create demand more and better than anybody else, A, and B, just the sheer network and our ability to get products to market uh, puts us in a very good position in terms of our ability to source products on a worldwide basis. Um, at, and, and have it, you know, very low deliver cost. Thank you. Thank you, man. 
I didn't mean to throw you off the stage. Uh, we're, again, thank you very much sure. for super remarks. And again, thank you everyone here. We have a uh, commemorative plaque that we'd like to give Manny from the World Trade Center. It's actually a plate from the Plimsoll Club, uh, the real Plimsoll Club that's over uh, in the thing over there. And uh, we, we'd like to thank Manny for today you, and uh, everything it. in the you. future. Good luck. Thanks thank again. Thank you very much. Just to wrap up, everybody, again, thank you to uh, First NBC Bank and Jones Walker for your sponsorship, and thanks to every one of you individually for being here. We can't do this without you. Um, we have another speaker series coming up if you want to put it into your phone, uh, October 3rd, and that is uh, a gentleman by the name of Dan Smallwood from Conoco Phillips, and he's in their deep water and uh, Arctic operation, so it should be pretty interesting. We encourage all of you to promote this event, bring other friends. We can get a bigger room if we need to. Please um, help us, support us in this. And then we have another event on October 11th is the uh, International Trade Gala, which will be at the uh, World War II Museum. And that's a, a big event. That'll be a, a nighttime reception and uh, one that you don't want to miss. So put October 3rd, October 11th on your calendar. And uh, we, again, thanks on behalf of the World Trade Center. You all have a great day.